our eternal salutations to that one whose glories are sung in the various scriptures of the different religious traditions of the world, but whose infinite and undying grandeur no mortal mind can comprehend. Our eternal salutations to that one upon whom the devotees meditate in the shrine of their hearts, realizing an ineffable presence in their deepest contemplations. May he prompt our minds toward the path of truth and righteousness. May she reveal herself into our souls and dispel the gloom of death, fear, doubt, and darkness. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat. Welcome here this morning to our SRV associations and our early morning satsang. We've just concluded one hour of meditation from 6 to 7. And now from 7 to 15 till about 8 o'clock we will enter into some Atma Vichara or inquiry into the nature of the self, which proceeds in my way of thinking to look into the nature of the non-self first as before you know who you are you have to know what you are not so that you don't confuse the matter. So we look into those two great principles of Samkhya philosophy called Purusha and Prakriti. Prakriti being nature in its manifested and its unmanifested form and Prakriti being the, I'm sorry, Purusha being the soul of mankind. Sometimes we call in Vedanta the Atman, that unconditioned consciousness as contrasted to consciousness with overlays on it or conditionings or attributes or qualities. <clears throat> in other words, rather the difference between the formless essence which is in everything and the reality with form, maybe some call it, call it saguna brahman, or with attributes, with gunas, with qualities. And today being, or yesterday specifically being Ram Navami, we had our puja last night for Sri Ram, and also a Shiva puja, and sang some Ram Bhajan, so we are set up for this weekend's class, which is at 2.30 this afternoon, Hawaii time, which will be on the Advaita of the Avatars, our fourth installment of that particular subject. So we're warming up to that, and we're already warmed up with our puja last night and our meditation this morning, so I'm going to open the field, that is the mind field, the mental field, for questions that might be growing there, either knowingly or unknowingly questions pop up and <clears throat> deserve to be answered and it's also just a good form of spiritual communication that we engage in. Our founder Lex Hickson used to ask questions even though he knew the answers. Just to break the ice sometimes he would, he would ask questions which he already knew the answers for and just to get people thinking about certain things. So anything is fair game but we particularly like in Sangha life, that is SRV Sangha life and Ramakrishna order and other orders that are, and other religions too that are uh, involved in inquiry into the nature of reality. Uh, we particularly like those subjects called Brahman or Almighty Father if you wish, Buddha nature, and also it's the Atman, the soul of mankind, and their, and their relation. Sometimes they call that Paramatman and Jivatman, the embodied soul and then the supreme soul that exists in, in the five sheaths, or five coverings, body, energy, mind, intellect, and ego. And also, we can also take up the sadhana portion of the spiritual life, that is, questions about your practices and disciplines, techniques used for removing ignorance, 
ignorance, which is an overlay. It's not, not, in, not anything real or substantial. It has no real substance to it. We just look into it and bring the light of Brahman to it, and it dissipates like a fog bag out of the sun. Also, a fourth topic is there, Maya, which is there in everything and in everyone. That is basically the world of name and form in time and space based on cause and effect or karma. That's a good definition for Maya. Nama, Rupa, Desha, Kala, Nimitta. Those, that quintuplication or that duality in Triputi, if you want to call it that way, is also fair game for the aspirant to look into because that's what is perplexing the mind <coughs> and diluting it, taking it away from the singular subject of Brahman, which is ever one beyond all origins. So then, if there's any questions that you have to write in for the live streaming audience, or if there are questions here from the five or six students who have attended a meditation at our ashram this morning, then we should open up the field for that. Who has the first question? Any there? No, there's none on live stream. We have a question. We have a question here. Okay, so, Babaji, what is the relation between prana and akasha? And how can this inform our meditation on non-dual reality? So three things are mentioned there. Prana, Akasha, and Advaita, or Brahman. And the question is put in such a way as that, what is the connection between Prana and Akasha? And how can it inform our meditations on non-dual reality? So the question already supposes that there is a non-dual reality, so I like that. That non-dual rea dual reality we just called Advaita Vedanta is the way in which we title it in Vedanta. That is, Vedanta does include, many people don't clarify this, some maybe don't even know it, it does include dualistic and qualified non-dualistic levels of thinking. Pray to your Father in Heaven would be dualism, and it means that God and man are two different things. And then, I'm the vine and you're the branches, as Christ said, would be that qualified non-dualism, which brings a connection between man and the Son of God, and hopefully between both of those and divine reality, be the perfect, in other words. And then Advaita is this, which has just come up in this question, is the non-dual reality, the not tuness or the absence of manyness, which in yoga would be the absence of, of thought, that is, intrusive thoughts called klista vrittis, the vibrations in the mind. All thought is vibration. In fact, everything in the realm of name and form and time and space, based in causation, is vibration. From the word, which was in the beginning, all the way down to the five elements here congealing as different objects, which the senses are involved in, sometimes attached to, or disidentifying, which depends on what stage of life you're in. So in all of that, there's this life force called prana. It's one of the missing links in our Western thinking. I often use the adage of Jesus when he said, man does not live by bread alone. I don't think he was talking about the, the spirit there because the spirit is something which is non-dual, uh, is, is formless, uh, so it's transcendent of the process, of all processes, that is, evolution being the main process. So when we look for a missing link between food and energy and senses, we look for something by which the eye sees, or by which the ears hear, or by which the hands touch, by which the nose smells. We look for the silverness in silver, the goldness in gold, the manliness in man, the womanliness in woman, as Vivekananda has put it. We look for a connecting point, and that prana is that. That prana really is shakti. And those two words might as well bring in another pregnant Sanskrit word there. Lots of meaning in it, because it is energy, but energy happens at different levels. 
like in food, it would be the grossest level of energy. Grossest here doesn't mean horrible, this means most apparent. Uh, so <laughs> at the level of um, food, that's the densest vibration, isn't it? Dense is another good word. It doesn't mean dense here, necessarily. This means thick. And that too doesn't mean, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Words. So we can step up in that level of vibration and see a prana, uh, an energy that is electric and kinetic and so forth. We can look at it scientifically, but then we can look at a, an energy that by which the eye sees. What is the power of the eye to see? And that's why they call the five senses in India, Indriyas. Uh, if you know that word, Indriya, it means Indra is the god of gods. He presides over all the levels in, in the lower and higher heavens, you might call them, if we want to make correlations again. So that prana is blamed, <laughs> and so now you look at it, either blamed or held responsible for the power of the eyes to see, that is the power of the eyes to fasten on things and not let go of them. And that would be a kind of blame. Whereas the yogi, of course, would just be master of the prana and would be just using the prana to observe see, or to subsist, to sit. The prana is rather in abeyance right now in my body because I've mastered my posture so I can sit like this for a long time. So the prana has been brought under control. And sometimes one of the best ways to do that is through the breathing process, right? Because prana, yam, or the five pranas are both indicated, inferred, and also mastered um, by the power of the lungs to breathe in and out. Puraka, kumbhaka, rechaka, they call it in yoga, the in-breath, the held breath, and the out-breath. And if one knows the three levels of the breath, then one can breathe consciously, which is what happens in Buddhist circles and Vedanta circles when you first go there, if you still have an erratic mind. If the mind is still imbued with rajas, frenetic activity, it can't control itself. It's got lots of energy, so tamas, slothfulness, isn't a problem. Uh, not all the time, anyway. So most people have that sort of habit of restlessness or brooding, uh, although brooding can be tamasic, too. So if you want to control that prana, then you just breathe in and out. And we know that even just simple breathing helps slow the heart rate, and if the heart rate slows, then the mind stops thinking so fast. And you can be at peace, which is really the best way to be all the time anyway, is just to be at peace. The peace that passes all, un all understanding, that's for later, but the peace just generally that you need first and foremost, as Holy Mother said, that you need to attain first, and you need to attain that in a way that it never leaves you, and that you can do all actions in peacefulness rather than in rajas. So, back to specifically to your question, that prana, when it's arrested, like, like you're the police, you know, and it's a criminal, I arrest you, you see. You're going to stop doing your functions when I tell you to, see, and I'm going to, or I'll put you in jail, you see. So, that prana is happening in the akashas. The akashas are locations. I mean, you could probably make correlations with the akashas, with the five sheaths that we just talked about, the physical body, the prana is another akasha, the mind is another akasha with its thoughts, the intelligence of the mind is another akasha, and the ego is even another akasha, the sense of individuality. See, that's putting it a little bit more philosophically, scientifically. But you can also go to other systems, say like the Kundalini Yoga system, and talk about the seven chakras, and there you're really talking about seven akashas, seven different kinds of space. So it's one of the drawbacks to our Western upbringing and education, as profound as it is on the physical level, hasn't penetrated through towards the energy of the prana. Man does not live by bread alone. There's another energy we have to be looking at, and if we look at that, we can understand death, for instance. Pra, you know, when, when the prana, the br lungs don't move, move anymore, don't breathe anymore, oh, he's dead, right? So uh, he's a non-entity now, he's not breathing, see. 
but he was an entity once, because he breathed. So we consider this breath as being crucial between, the, between life and death. So if you want to master death, you're going to also master the prana, which means you can breathe while you still sit. Uh, you can stop your breathing. It's called kumbhaka. And sometimes we do it in deep sleep. Maybe if you're laying next to your spouse at night and, or your kids, and you hear them breathing, all of a sudden they stop breathing for two or three minutes. You wonder if they've left. Did they die? Uh, but they've just gone into kumbhaka, a suspended state, and guess what? They didn't do any damage to their brain when they didn't breathe for three, four, five minutes. They, there's, it was a suspended breath. And uh, so you were in a kind of suspended animation, and the prana was arrested at that time. You put him in handcuffs. See? And then all of a sudden, the sound of aqua lung again, you see snorkels, and start to, lungs start pumping in the outer, outer air. Well, it, this outer air is an akasha, it's a physical akasha, but you went into a pranic akasha. So you, you, the prana w w w was, uh, it turned out the lights of your city. See, Purusha really means a uh, city of nine gates, sometimes they say, you know, nine apertures that, that are there, eyes, ears, and so forth. So there's an indweller in the city, and that indweller can light up the city, or it can turn it dark. You see, like day and night. In other words, bring consciousness to it, or it can it can put consciousness in abeyance, just just rest in a in a, st in a static state. So all very interesting when you bring up words like prana and akasha and start making connection. You open up the whole field, not just the periphery of the field, but the whole inner field, the kingdoms of heaven within you. You open all that up for an inspection because now you've, you've not only suggested that it exists, which is the first hurdle for most people that don't even know that anything like that exists. It's all the bhutakasha and nothing else. That's a materialist. It's all matter. And that's, that's the end of the, of, of, of the whole picture, you see. But if you can suggest the prana, if you can open that up, then all of a sudden you open up this whole field to other levels of consciousness, they call it, or different lotuses. See? Now, you can see how that could help you in meditation to conclude your question, answer to your question, or you can see also how I can go on and on forever <laughs> on answering this question because it is such a fascinating topic and I've given it lots of thought and so have the seers and sages and the scriptures. I've given it lots of thought. So you look into scriptures like Yoga Vashishta and, and, uh, and other great testaments to prana and to consciousness and to shakti. Um, you, you'll find uh, they have a lot to say about it. Uh, and th those come from their own realizations because the scriptures are not just books that someone wrote. They're actually testaments of what they experienced. So the revealed scriptures particularly are exceedingly profound and, and very adept at answering any questions you might have. You, sh you should read them and take them in. A whole, there should be a long period of that, maybe a lifelong period of study of the Jnana Yoga, which we will be doing this afternoon for three hours. So you can see how this would connect to meditation. Now if you took Father of Yoga's way of saying it, he calls these stations, if, uh, I, I sometimes call them stations, sort of like satellite stations, you know. I saw the headline of a paper just accidentally, because I never read the paper, but I, saw, I, was, I was washing some carrots. I put down some newspaper to dry them on, see, and there was a headline there. And it said, they're selling tickets to space station now. The, the rocket and the station don't exist yet but they're still selling tickets for the future. So people are going to be able to ride in a rocket to the space station pretty soon and then you know, ride back, sort of like a Disneyland thing. So uh, I call these inner land stations, is what I'm saying. They're sort of satellite stations away from your body. You know? So it, they're stations of consciousness, conscious awareness. And that's what, that's what an akasha would be, for instance. And there's a prana that takes you there, you see. So it's just like going on an outer journey. There's an outer prana and there's an outer world, right? So there's also inner prana as an inner world that take you inward. And uh, one of those would be, you know, you would access by, by becoming aware of your own lungs, your own set of lungs. 
not only that they breathe, but they can also stop breathing. Not only that they stop breathing, but when they stop breathing, you don't die in every instance. There are yogis and yoginis who can stop the breathing process and still live. Sort of like deep sea divers or pearl, pearl divers, you see, four or five minutes underwater without, without breathing. So this control of that kind of prana brings out the inference of a land which it abides in. And so it does open up everything for an inner meditation. Now, I, I was talking about Father of Yoga. He calls these stations alambanas. It's an interesting Sanskrit word, alambanas. It, it means a foundation for meditation. So I've always considered it rather odd that people say, I don't know what to meditate on. But they can take their breath and meditate on that. That's a very good start, which I was just saying they have you do. Uh, even amidst the but akasha, that is the akasha of outer things, you could take water and meditate on that, or land, or fire, the sun, a candle in a window's place, whatever you want. They're called pratikas and pratimas, and you can just take that as your meditation. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is you're just stopping the mind from thinking of anything else, just that one thing, because its problem is that it's scattered called Shatavadana, thinking of a thousand things at once. And the Tantrasis knew about it way back earliest India. You see, even before the Vedasis were probably there in India, people living along the Indus rivers, later became known Hindus, probably just meditated on Pratikas and Pratimas, those little stone Shiva, you see, just because that kept their mind from wandering. Candle in a windless place, again, in the Gita, Bhagavad Gita from Sri Krishna. So, those are stations and symbols, and the prana is rather a living symbol. It's, it's more sentient than an object. So, whether you take an insentient object, a pratika or a pratima, uh, a pratima, would, the difference between them was one would be more like a, an idol or a picture, a picture of, of a, or, or an image, see, and the other would be just a, pretty much a, um, any kind of symbol, anything that pleases you, Patanjali says in his Yoga Sutras. Anything that helps your mind meditate, gives you a good feeling. That, that's fair grounds for sitting and, and, and meditating. And if you, know, you find out that meditation is an odd combination of disconnecting and connecting. Now I'm making a lot of connections for you in the Sanskrit and in the philosophy and so forth, so that you can consider them later. So. Before you connect them, you'll have to disconnect from other things. Say, for instance, your ignorance. You might want to disconnect from that. Maybe divorce it for good and make wisdom, put wisdom in the throne where ignorance once was, you see. It, it, ignorance must abdicate, you see, and you, you must bring a new king to that throne. That's going to be called for a while anyway until the Atman is, is installed there. It's going to be called knowledge or wisdom. So that's brought about by making connections that destroy connections that are unhealthy. Well, pa Father of Yoga calls this klista and not klista vrittis, positive thoughts and negative thoughts. One gets rid of the other. So however way you put it, um, you can bring that positivity to bear by meditating on these connections. Now you have to know that as you do, you're moving from levels of consciousness, just like you did last night when you went to sleep, and then you went from waking to dream, then you went from dreaming to deep sleep, then you came back from deep sleep to dream, and now you've come to this dream. You've come back to dream number one, the first station. So your consciousness is moving, isn't it, without really going anywhere. It's shifting stations, because it's everywhere at once, yet it has this ability to shift stations or shift levels just like you would shift a car. See? In fact, sometimes they call this your vehicle. Why not look at the body just as a vehicle rather than yourself? If you look at the body as yourself, that's the first evolutive maya, or the first and strongest, hardest bond to break. According to the tantrasis, the first evolutive maya is, I am the body. That's the worst thing you can, you can do, think. So start looking at it as a vahana, a vehicle. 
and uh, prana is helping you move uh, from dreaming to deep sleep and back to waking. There's, there's an energy that's helping you do that. You don't just think and then it happens, but you know, there's an act and then there's an energy and then there's the thought and those three are connected. So in that way, if you connect those kinds of thoughts up, prana, the energy, akasha, the space that the energy is in, and remember, if you shift space, you're going to shift energies. This is what we would hope science would understand by studying the vibrating particle, that everything's vibration. We hope that people would come to understand that if you shift out of one akasha to another akasha, then you shift energies. Or you could put it, if you shift energy, you shift akashas. Buddhists call it bardos. I mean, if, if I'm all of a sudden very sleepy, you know, and all of a sudden I, I, I suddenly get energy, then I've shifted space. I've shifted to a different level of my own consciousness. Now, if you note that, then all of a sudden you, you ask yourself, you know, why should I ever be lazy? Well, you know, why should I let laziness happen? Why should tamas come over me? I should, just, I should just have energy all the time. Sattva. I should just have balanced energy all the time. So, it's not just in meditation with your eyes closed that God exists. It's in, with eyes open that God exists too. That is, prana exists at many different levels and there are many different akashas. Uh, every breath almost brings in another level of consciousness if you're aware of your breath, that is. That's why they have you concentrate on your breathing because it really shifts your consciousness. That's what's happening. It shifts your station from one place to another. So there's some thoughts about that question. Uh, prana, life force, akasha, space at different levels, like five different Russian dolls, you know, tucked back inside of each other. It's five different akashas. And then the meditation upon those two and how, how uh, better meditation is afforded by becoming aware of those things. So I would say, short answer to your question, yes. <laughs> In other words, just become aware that there is prana and there's akasha, and then use them to meditate. It's not, it's not whether they exist or, or uh, how to make the connection. It's just uh, affirm them and then meditate. The mind, the mind would be very dexterous that way. Uh, you can master the prana, and then after that you master the mind. But you're not going to master the mind until you master the prana. If you're talking about people who are already mastered, they mastered the mind first in a previous lifetime, and then when they come here, they control the prana already. It's their pet dragon bird. See, they've already got it tamed. But for other people who have a restless mind, they're still working on mastering the prana, bringing it under control. So. Any other questions this morning? Um, well, you already answered most of this question that I was going to ask, but um, I'll ask you anyways. Which technique of uh, obtaining mastery of concentration do you advise the most, and why do you advise that? One question comes then, uh, which technique for mastering consciousness is best, and, and why do I recommend that? Hmm. Well, um, I'm not a man who has a hard time making choices. <laughs> just, um, my problem is there's too many techniques. Yeah. <laughs> not that there's just one. Yeah. But I can say this about the technique everyone will have to use, and that is it will have to come to some sort of concentration of mind. So uh, the best way, I think, or maybe the only way in my way of thinking is, is discrimination, viveka, which is why Swami Vivekananda took the name because he thought that was most important and nowhere was it more evident that it was needed than in the West when he came here. Because he was about to come to the West you know, so, so you, and the Parliament of Religions and he called him, was calling himself Satchitananda and by other names when he was a sannyasin in India. He came here, he took the name Vivekananda. Let's teach them the art of discrimination between the real and the unreal. Because as long as you're still obsessing with or encountering, having relations with the unreal, 
things that aren't essential, and you don't see the essential yet. You haven't separated the wheat from the chaff, to use a biblical term. Then you're never going to be able to concentrate on reality. So that is the one singular way in which the bhakta, the jnani, the raji, uh, those who meditate, and the karmi, the one who does action, uh, how they will, the one technique that they will use to deepen their spiritual life is going to be discrimination between the real and the unreal. Ekam sattvi prabhuta vedanti, yes, there are many paths that reach the mountain summit, as they say. Uh, one goal, many paths, or one divine reality with many names. They, they put that in different ways. It's, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, universal statement on reality in the world, in the history of the world, in the Rig Veda, one of the oldest scriptures. Ekam sat, one truth. So, many ways to get there, but I'd say all of those ways, as they approach the mountain top, they'll find one pathway that reaches the summit. Those many paths will have to meld into one. So that will have to be oneness itself is the best technique. That's why we call ourselves Advaita Vedantas. Holy Mother said, you may be all uh, devotees of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa in, in this fold, in this Sangha. But because you are devotees of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, that means you're Advaitists. If somebody had asked her, should we do worship, or you know, should we do pujas, or should we do this and that? What kind of sadhana should we do? And she says, you're all Advaita Vedantas. You should know that there's one reality and it exists at all times. And it doesn't transform itself. It doesn't change. It doesn't go through birth and death. And it doesn't move from space to space. And it's not the prana. So all of these things we just mentioned are techniques for getting your mind together, uh, they're, they're as if pointless when you know that one reality. Sri Ramakrishna used to put it, when there's a flood everywhere, what's the use of a water tank? Everything overflows, there's just water everywhere, then you don't need to put water in any tank. So that's this Advaita Vedanta. According to the way Sri Ramakrishna taught the young Vivekananda, Narendra, when he was a boy, is that you put this in your wearing cloth first, this one bit of knowledge, Advaita, and then you go anywhere and do anything you want. You only get in, can get into the realm of multiplicity or diversity if you have this one. Seek thee first the king of heaven, in other words. see, If you have that, and you really have it deep in you, and you know that's the ultimate truth, and no matter where you go or what you do, you're safe. Philosophically, mentally, even physically, because you know birthless and deathlessness of the soul. So, it's kind of a contradiction I'm posing here because it's not really a technique. Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta is not a technique, it's not a method. Yet, by manning yourself with it, you have all techniques and all methods. And anything you do will be successful. It's, it's marvelous. And that's how Sri Ramakrishna realized the truth of all religions. He could put Mother Kali and the gods and goddesses, Hindu gods and goddesses away and take up the Muslim tradition and take a Muslim teacher and get to the bottom of Allahu Akbar, you see, mm -hmm. find out what the big, the great mantra, the great Mahavakya in, in Sufism and, and in Islam is, you see. How could he do that? By being a non-dualist. By knowing that all religions are essentially one. Uh, before he even started into expecting them as separate doctrines or separate paths. So Prati Tantra Siddhanta is, is um, expecting, inspecting religions as different paths. And, uh, and then there's a way of reconciliation, sarva, uh, tantra, siddhanta. So you, you inspect things from, this, from the standpoint that all these religions are not separate paths, I'm going to reconcile them. So that's sort of like dualism and then qualified non-dualism, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But the real way is the sarva, tantra, siddhanta, uh, or sahaja, tantra, siddhanta, it means 
natural oneness. I don't need to reconcile them. They were never many. They were always one. That's the way the avatar looks at it, and it's the way we'll talk about it at today's class. The Advaita of the avatars is exactly that. They're using this one way of, they start off on the right footing, of knowing that everything is at one moment, Advaita, unified. They don't need to harmonize. Harmony comes later, you know, hopefully you get harmony. But you realize in the world, peace never lasts for very long. There's war all the time coming and going in and out, so it's always spoiling the feast. And so it's, people are seeking harmony, but the beings who understand or comprehend that reality is, is unity, that harmony is a, is a secondary measure. They live in that, in that oneness. For instance, right now, here we are in this room, in oneness, in wisdom, in peace. But there's wars raging around all, all around the world. No matter how much war rages, there's always going to be peace there. And uh, so, beyond techniques, and beyond religions, even beyond philosophy, is this Advaita Vedanta, which is the principle whose time has come. It's, if you want to call it in action, it's universality. It's, the, it's operating or existing on the premise that this oneness is the absolute truth of everything. And you, you just walk around shored up with it. So you, you live in it. I saw my teacher doing that until, up until his 90s when he left the body. And it was very hard to discern what he was doing, how he was doing that, and never changing, always the same, always satisfied, always content. Didn't matter what was happening. So it, it's why we live with illumined souls, because the more, whether they're Zen Buddhist or Advaita Vedantists or Muslims, if we find an illumined soul among them, that's, that's the characteristic that's making them illumined. So, if you want to talk about techniques, then you talk more about yoga. I mean, basically, we're talking about Advaita Vedanta, but if you want to talk about techniques, then you go to yoga. That's more of a practice. Advaita Vedanta is just a statement of truth. You, you can't in the, look in the Upanishads. They're not telling you do this, do that. Mm -hmm. The Upanishads are our Bible. You hardly find any mention of a practice in the Upanishads. 108 of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're telling you, thou art that. That's what they're telling you. Four greatest statements in the Upanishads are, thou art that, this self is Brahman, this self is pure intelligence, and and uh, I am Brahman, I am that. So that's their message, that's their essence. Now fall out of that and you, you've fallen out of yoga, so you're going to have to take up yoga. Hatha yoga, not very adequate for the task of realization. It treats the bhutakasha only, the mm -hmm. outer space only. But if it can act up with a prana, pranayama is a technique. You see this better than hatha yoga. Usually they try and put those two together. But when you get to pranayama, then you're beginning to control an energy. You're beginning to get a little bit of control over your, over your what? Over your thoughts, over your mind. You don't, because if you leave pranayama by itself, you've controlled your breathing. Big deal. You, know, you can control a bellows, can't you? Just pump slower or faster make the fire burn. The same with your lungs. You can have it pump faster, pump slower. That's not mastery. So you're, you're trying to control something that's much more essential to your existence, and that's your mind. The mind is everything, my child. You're going to take it with you to Brahman. Holy Mother said that to us. The mind is everything, my child. You're going to have to take it with you to Brahman. So it's very important to you right now. So 
that comes mana yoga. She called it mana yoga or buddhi yoga. You have to work with your mind and its intelligence. Mana yoga, buddhi yoga. So that's the, that's the best yoga you can take up. And it, it couples nicely with this jnana yoga. Clarifying the mind. Khyati. You need clarification. People are running around in bodies, in the world, with erratic breathing, or frenetic minds, restless energy, doing all sorts of ungodly acts because they don't have khyati. They have khyati or clarity, then they would stop, cease, and be still, and peace would come to them. Oh, where's peace? Where's peace? You can't get peace while you're running around, running yourself ragged. You're going to have to simulate peace. Assimilate the teachings and then simulate peace. And that means you're going to have to sit like this, right? This brings everything under my control, my posture and my breathing. But that's not the, the uh, end of it by any means. Because the mind can still be running circles and running itself ragged, even when you sleep. Isn't your body, and we just said your breathing stopped in sleep, it's cut down from 240,000 breaths a day to 120 at night. You've cut your breathing in half without even practicing pranayama. <laughs> it's called ajapa. You're not doing any breathing or any repetition. See, no japa. It's just one state of uniform awareness. But did it, real, did it enlighten you? Did you stop in your breathing tonight, cutting it in half? Did it get you enlightened? Did your body going into the asana of supine state, did that enlighten you? No, you wake up the same fool as you went to sleep. <laughs> does, so does pranayam, uh, is pranayam the, um, the, the, the main technique for mastering concentration? Is pranayama the same technique, the, the best, main, the, main, the, the best. main technique for mastering concentration for those who are unfocused, yes. Mm -hmm. For those who need to, who want to practice yoga, which is what I'm saying. Uh, if you don't already know that, that uh, Brahman is in everything and everywhere and I am that, if you don't know that, as Krishna says in the Gita, then you have to do a practice. And so, most people will revert to uh, pranayama because it, it does help get your mind uh, together. Patanjali says, you know, kshipta, scattered mind, mudha, dull mind, vikshipta, scattered and dull <laughs> together, back and forth. Then finally, if you can get over those three, then they'll teach you yoga. They won't teach you yoga in the traditional way if, if you have not gotten control of those three. And the fourth is ekagra, means one-pointed, if I and I be single. So now all of a sudden, you know, I'm so one-pointed, I'm, I'm hearing everything my teacher says. And it's making sense to me, whereas when I was in these other three port states of mind, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't have kyati. I wasn't clear. But if I can get into an ekagri state of mind and go and listen to an illumined soul talk, poof, right like that, all of a sudden I have the truth. Everything seems clear to me and I leave clear. Now it's a matter of holding on to that clarity. So you see how Father of Yoga is working up. This isn't Advaita coming down. Avatar descends. This is Jivatman coming up, you see. Working its way up towards that perfection which is an eternal verity. It's not something that you can uh, that you can evolve to, but the mind is 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 acclimatizing to its rare atmosphere, which is everywhere. It's getting clear, so it means all the barriers are being broken down. I want to become rich with the whole territories of Divine Mother Reality. Ram Prasad sings in one of his songs. See? I have an acre. But now I want to expand and, no, and own the whole territory. It means I'm going to have, cut down a lot of jungle, you see. So my mind is a jungle, and I have one acre cleared. I have to go from there and start weed whacking, you see. 
the machete. So if, uh, if you use this prana then to get control of the mind, that's what most people will uh, default to. And they're working towards uh, chit shuddhi, pure mind. And when they get chit shuddhi, then pretty much the game is over. The game of maya is over. And they've arrived at a station, as I was just saying, where they can abide peacefully. You need peace of mind first and foremost, she said, Holy Mother. So it's just like the difference between happiness and joy is the difference between contentment and peace. Get contentment first, and then peace comes from that. And then from that, the peace that passes all understanding comes later. But again, that's working up. That's a yoga. That's a purification. That's an austerity. And that's a journey. And that's spiritual evolution. And none of it exists. There's only one Brahman, and it never needed that. And you're that. So there's this very strange contradiction and dichotomy between you know, matter and spirit, between God and mankind, between nature and spirit. Uh, and we're always trying to make these connections that can bring our understanding back to comprehension of the oneness of all things, inherent oneness, intrinsic oneness. So when one is doing daily activities, one should infuse uh, breathing, mantra, and that certain activity to, to uh, develop in a way that is beneficial for himself? Well, you're not hearing me, really. I mean, mm -hmm. you, should, you should have that Advaitic attitude. That's what you should be infusing everything with. And then do your breathing and your activities in that. Mm -hmm. Not do your activities in the breathing and in the breathing in the mind, but you should have that. You should read the non-dual scriptures that are telling you over and over again the oneness between the Jivatman and the Paramatman, the divine relationship between mankind and God. Ishvara, or better yet, the oneness between the apparently individualized soul and the supreme soul, like a wave in the ocean. I give up my waveness, I'll become the ocean, right? It's just a matter of course, and, and a few minutes' time, maybe a few seconds' time. So when I rose off the ocean and took a form called wave, then I was never separate from that ocean. A wave doesn't all of a sudden rise up in the air and look down in the ocean and say, I'm different than you. Water is water. So do everything, all your actions, your breathing, your spiritual practice, your eating, everything. Practice the uh, presence of God or the Advaita Vedanta in everything. Don't sit, don't sit to breathe and think, I'm going to master my breath now. Think, the breath is mastered and I'm going to remind myself of the fact. So you could at least do that. Mm -hmm. Or sit in an asana and say, somehow this is going to get me healthy or get me, uh, get me a vision or, or get me illumined. The self is already illumined. There's a beautiful saying in one of those non-dual scriptures that puts it very nicely. They say, um, a sh um, Sadanga yoga natu naiva shuddham. Guru padesha natu naiva shuddham. Mano vinasha natu naiva shuddham. Well, Sadanga yoga means the six limb yoga, or eight limb yoga if you wish. The eight limb yoga will not get you, will not purify the self. Guru padesha, padesha feet, bowing at the Guru's feet will not get you will not purify the self. And then manumanasham, vinasha means destruction. Destruction of the mind's waves will not purify the self. These are the three greatest techniques, right? The mana yoga, the breathing and all that. Why won't they purify the self? Because the self is already pure. <laughs> That's the Advaita Vedanta, that's the Zen Buddhism, that's the start. 
Uh, and any of these practices that you undertake, which are very refined and time-tested, that's what they're always trying to communicate to you, and most people are coming to them without that essential bit of information. They're still thinking, I must evolve. But evolution's a myth. It's based in time, and time's an illusion. Back to the first question, I should probably cut time down. There's a song in India that says, practice meditation and cut time down, then you'll be fine. See? Well, the same with space. You should probably cut away all different kinds of space because you're in this space right now and you're running out to work and you're in that space then and then you're going to a party that night and you're in that space then. You're coming home and going to sleep, you're in that space then. You just move through four or five different akashas right there with some erratic prana. See? But why not sit in one place the whole time and let your body do that? See, your body went to work, your body went to the party, your body went there, but I never moved. See? Mm -hmm. So as you're out there working and doing that, you're thinking, my body's still back there on my asana, sitting like this, and it never moves. My real self is there. It's immovable, unchangeable. It's all pervasive, so it doesn't have to move. Something that's everywhere doesn't have to go moving around looking for itself. <laughs> so that's the one essential bit of information. You'd be, you know, it's easy to listen to it here and say, I understand it. But when you get into the life and disease and change and death and happiness and excitement and this and that, it's very hard to hang on to that. Uh, and in, in uh, cycles, you know, let's say there's a, like a 24-hour cycle going on inside of a 12-day you know, cycle, and that's going, or a one-week cycle, and that's going on inside of you know, a 12-year cycle. And that cycle is going on inside a whole lifetime cycle. And then there's the lifetime of Lord Brahma and so forth. So you've got these cycles inside of cycles that are always going on, these kala chakras, these wheels of time that are spinning all the time, like this big clock, you see, with many gears. Uh, so you need to wait for that right moment when that, the clock's gears all stop spinning and you can see through the clock. There's one time like the clock Sri Ramakrishna saw in Calcutta, you see, when he was living. There was one time at the museum clock, one day out of 365 days, when all the gears came together and you could see through the clock. So you have to practice meditation and cut time down when that moment happens, when you can see through the, all the workings of these different akashas and these different pranas, and via one of your meditations, you see. one superlative meditation I had showed me the truth, I got kyati and I was free. All you need to do is just prove it to yourself once. So that's what all spiritual effort's about, is to have that one superlative moment, vision. Otherwise, you're getting close to it with insights. You're reading the scriptures and you're saying, that's marvelous, you see, oh, how, how great, you see. Or, or you're having meditations that give you bliss, so, but say, oh, I had great bliss today. Oh, did it transform you? Well, no, I don't have it anymore. See. It came and it went. My vision came and it went, but my character didn't come and go. My character, my nature, the Atman didn't come and go. It was the one thing that was with me all the time, and in fact, that was the one thing that gave me bliss. Myself is bliss. Ananda, that's why there's so many people in the world with the last name Ananda. <laughs> because they found that one, they had that one superlative moment. And I think I'll dedicate my life to that, because I don't see anything else worth dedicating it to. Yes, yes, we have time for another question. Um, what is an illumined approach to dealing with acts of violence, <clears throat> um, specifically referring to the recent uh, Boston bombings? Mm -hmm. So what is an illumined approach to dealing with uh, 
this world, this unreal world that we live in. Um, acts of horrific violence, um, that's one question. And the other part is about sorrow and anger. When I get connected to the collective consciousness through whatever means, often sorrow and anger are sorrow for the people who are the victims and anger for at the perpetrators. Mm. And my question with that part of it is, how do I deal with that? Do I transcend it? Do I use Buddhist practice where we take on the suffering of others? Do I do prayers for the perpetrators? I get confused on those two issues. Mm. Yeah. I mean, just basically to try and sum it, what you're saying for the live stream audience is mm -hmm. the, the recent, well, the ongoing series of bombings that are always happening. We might as well not just focus in on one of them because they're always going on. Terror well, terrorism. <laughs> this one, the recent one in Boston stirred it up for her, so we'll, we'll be contemporary here with the live streaming audience and, and they'll know that we're here in 2013 dealing with the issues inside of our Vedantic Sangha. Um, how, and what that brings up, she's saying, in, in, in terms of uh, how to deal with it, techniques to deal with it, and also the sorrow and the anger, the passions, we would say, in Vedanta, the emotions that it brings up at the same time. Um, and you said living in this unreal world and how to deal with it. So if, if the realization has been had that all of these things are unreal, of course, then the question wouldn't rise up. <laughs> if it is really all, all unreal, then our emotions are unreal, the world's unreal, the acts are unreal, and so forth. But that really sounds like a kind of uh, cop-out of responsibility. We have a responsibility to the collective consciousness and it's not just us that know that, but the seers uh, who, who are part of the cosmic consciousness know that too. So there's a cosmic consciousness that's looking on, and then there's a collective consciousness that's involved in perpetrating, and then there's the individual consciousness of each soul that also has a way, that has to relate and, and deal with those actions. This is all the field of karma. And, of course, if we go back one question to this Advaitic, stance that we take, because you know, there are many asanas you can do, but you really want to get to the mental asana that's going to stabilize you forever, that's going to put all other movements and all other <coughs> uh, phenomena, is a good word, in, in, uh, in abeyance, so that you can live in one atmosphere all the time, the atmosphere of pure conscious awareness. They call things like grief and fear and anger, either the six passions or the eight fetters. Sometimes they call it the three great traps, like grief and sorrow. The three great traps, so they really want you not to get caught in them because you can't be an effective worker and an effective um, means for any kind of solution for those kinds of situations if you're caught in them. So, of course, we know that people who read the newspapers and get all bent out of shape and cuss and get angry and it's really not doing anything but making the situation worse, exacerbating it. So we don't want to fall into that kind of uh, predicament. Uh, you know, we're, we're, how they say, we're becoming more of a, uh, you know, uh, more of the problem and, and less of the solution. We're getting in our own way. So, I mean, I work with people in prison. Some of them have committed various acts in, uh, in an unthought moment or unconscious moment or for whatever reasons and, and uh, murdered somebody, killed someone. And then they have to deal with the parents and the relatives of, those, of that person that got murdered. And some of these people are quite remarkable. Uh, they will forgive the person who committed the, the crime. I've seen that happen. It's not just all anger and revenge out there. Oh, you did something, therefore eye for an eye kind of ideology going on, but basically there I've come across situations where people uh, have been uh, so gracious as to say, well, my child might have done the same thing in that situation. So there are people who are awakening a little bit to more refined ways of dealing. Uh, and that's going to have to be based upon the fact that we're one family. 
all races, I mean, something that the human race has been working on for hundreds and thousands of years is to try and get beyond the barrier of interracial dis you know, discrimination and that kind of problem so that we can see ourselves as one family and, and uh, one, this one family has these problems that are ongoing and, and really needs healing. So you come down to the level of healing and you necessarily depart the level of health. You see, you've given up spiritual health and you're, you're coming down to the world to help people heal their passions, their emotions. And their emotions and passions, you see, are based around phenomena, sensation. Uh, and to such an extent sometimes that you see that there are groups of people who actually love sensation, love phenomena. That life is too boring unless there's a couple murders going on or bombing or problems like that. And so uh, of the whole cross-section of society probably that eventually turns terrorist that has that kind of addiction to sensation, addiction to pain and suffering. And uh, not just causing others, they actually like to suffer too. They prefer suffering to peace. So what I'm getting at here in a sort of roundabout way, or I hope it's not so roundabout, is that there, there is a, a division between the divine and the demoniacal. There is a division of, between the discriminating person and the worldly person. And the people who make the cut in that division uh, and take up residence with the illumined souls, you know, they're people that are practicing the art of transcendence with compassion. See, it's not like we can transcend and leave the world alone because it's all unreal. And so it doesn't make any difference what we do. That would be a kind of transcendence without compassion. See? But uh, in the Buddhists, the Vedantists, and other, and the, and the souls that we've seen have, have come to earth, the avatars, as we'll talk about this afternoon, have come to earth to help people with those very same issues and those very same problems. And they're certainly not evincing some sort of a non-dual transcendence that has nothing to do with the world. There, there are souls who can do that. They're called videha muktis. They just will not come into bodies anymore. They stay in a supreme uh, state of formlessness all the time, and they act as examples for the possibility of that for others. It's not that that's, that's uh, somehow callous or unthinking, because it's just practical when you see that the world is unreal. Why, why would you hold on to it? You would give it up and stay formless. Which doesn't mean that you couldn't work from a formless state on the world keep a subtle body, they call it, or a causal body, and, and uh, be able to help people with these kinds of problems. But the, those who are more active or proactive in the world spiritually are more like the Jivan Muktas or the Bodhisattvas. Vedanta calls them Jivan Muktas, Buddhism calls them Bodhisattvas, and so they're going to come to earth and they're going to help people with these problems. Now, if you look at the kind of benefit and methods they bring, uh, they definitely point to transcendence. You're, you're going to want to uh, qualify yourself so that you can be free of ignorance and be peaceful. And to the degree that you realize that, your peacefulness can be used as a protection, an armor, for being amidst situations like you're describing. We're seeing that these situations, these bombings, are happening amongst people who are not discriminating, mostly. And, I mean, you could say there's innocent people involved, but you probably look at those innocent people and odds are you won't find a discriminating people among them. You mean the victims? Yeah, the victims. They're not spiritual aspirants. They're not taking the protection of discipline, spiritual discipline, the sadhana. That's why, you know, the, the devotees of the Lord are, are free from those kinds of problems. They always remain free from those kinds of problems. Makes them the best counselors, the gurus, the acharyas. And people go to them eventually and say, well, I had a horrible thing happen to me. 
what, it, what was that? Tell me. They tell them, and they say, here's the solution. Now, never get caught again. I'll free you and never get caught again. So that, that's a way of saving one at a time. See? But when this savior and this saving happens, this combination, those people move from one akasha, the akasha of the afflicted, to the akasha of the peaceful. And the akasha of the peace, peaceful does not have any more um, uh, association with affliction. It's freedom from affliction. That's what the father of yoga calls it. Kilesha or klesha or vikshepa or antaryaya is if you overcome those things, you're free from affliction. You're peaceful, you're healed. Uh, your uh, your dish is cooked. <laughs> you're not in the oven anymore. You've, you've realized a transcendent position. Can you relate this? Does this relate at all to that transcendence or acquisition of the first three great accomplishments? You know, transcendence mm -hmm. of inner, outer, and on high sufferings? Yes, she's bringing in the teaching of peace, 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 shanti, 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 which are, as Lord Kapila said, three of the eight great accomplishments. And um, if you have that, uh, adhyatmaka, adhidaivaka, adhibhaudaka, those kinds of things mentioned also in the Gita, then you have um, peace on all three levels of your existence, outer, inner, and transcendent. And then everywhere you go, you see nothing but peace. And this is why, say, Christ could see a stoning and, and stop it say, you know, well, those of you who are without fault, without sin, you cast the first stone. Instead of getting all caught up in the afflicted and the one who's being a, <laughs> uh, the, the afflictor, see. Completely and marvelously neutral, uh, transcendent, um, detached is a good word, dispassionate. So, non-emotional. Of course, but it's not a, a compassion that's um, based in pity or based in any sort of idea that maybe this scene that they're seeing has any great uh, merit whatsoever. Its only merit is to, just, is to show the difference between those who are uh, balanced and those who are imbalanced. And then you just want to bring balance to that equation, which he did. And they all put down their stones and walked away, and the adulteress wasn't stoned. And he told her, go and sin no more. <laughs> so here's the play, you see, of afflicted and afflictor, and here's the peaceful person walking into it. Now, that person, if he was a member of either of those parties, could not have done that. Since he was detached and dispassionate, then that was compassion. He made the most compassionate thing he could do was to get himself free of situations like that and never get involved with them again. Then when he walked around the world and came upon a situation like that, if that was what was going to happen with him, he automatically had the right solution for it from the standpoint of peace. So it's rather getting back towards that Advaitic station we just talked about how to keep that non-dual position. So are you saying that the victims are all people who do not, were not practicing the level of awareness, detachment, or whatever that you're talking about? They're it's not that the devotees of the world haven't come in contact with the Caesars of the world, mm -hmm. like in Christ's time. Uh, and uh, uh, persecution and various things like that have happened to them. But they've always showed a characteristic detachment from it. They've all for forborne it. Forbearance is the default zone of the wise. And when peace is shorn away, or they try and take peace away from you, you go to forbearance, just like a natural mm -hmm. setting. You just switch to forbearance. Oh, I see, peace isn't going to be here right now, so I'm going to shift to forbearance. Long-suffering. 
And it's just an automatic uh, modus operandi that happens to a soul who's practiced. And they're practiced and they know that because they know the world to be unreal. It's very difficult to try and explain it because it sounds like lack of compassion. And sometimes Buddhism and Vedanta are, are uh, blamed or, you know, for, for that kind of thing. Or like Buddha didn't believe in God, so people will... They say Buddha didn't believe in God, yet he had names for reality. Buddha nature and Pragyaparam, supreme intelligence. And he even named himself after that, Buddhi, Buddha. So the facts all point away from, um, point to the erroneousness of such an assumption on the parts of others. And their compassion is, is supreme compassion. And it's based on dispassion. So, non-involvement in the world, because it is unreal, is in direct correlation to how you can live in the world and, and be, a, be a force for higher good. <laughs> and you take that out of the equation, and you know, it just doesn't make sense. The luminous souls know this, and it's very, very clear to them, because they do have that clarity around it but the rest of us don't because we're still involved in the world and we still believe it to be real. In some way, it's real to us. When we say the world is unreal, we're not, we're not compromising whatsoever. It's, it's as unreal as an illusion mirage in a desert. That's how unreal it is. It's ever-changing. Can't be counted on. Can't build your house on it. Birds have nests, foxes have holes. You can't lay your head here. I mean, everyone who is anyone in any religion has said the same thing to you once they've had that realization. So they want you to hurry up and graduate to that realization, join the company of the illumined souls, and then if you're still in the world, as Holy Mother said, turn and help the people that you come in contact with. But if you go out and try and save the world, well, we've seen how that backfires. We don't have mature understanding and we're trying to help the world with our immature understanding. We're making it worse. So is it an immature understanding to say there are victims and, and perpetrators, but rather there are no victims and there are no perpetrators? But that's in the world of Maya. I mean, I'm just mm -hmm. following through my line of thinking as a way to remove myself from, well, if there's victims and perpetrators, then either I'm going to be involved emotionally against the perpetrator and for the victims, or if I get engaged that way, I'm going to think I'm a victim. So to go beyond that, just there are no victims, there are, it's all an exchange of energy. And, um, yes, I mean, there, you, can, you can reason it out that way. There's no doubt that there is karma to pay, let's put it that way. Yeah, that's one way. I don't want it to be a cop out. I mean, let's see, like, New Orleans has a great flood, right? And then the preachers get on the radio, New Orleans? Yeah. And then the preachers get on the radio and start saying, well, they deserved it because they were gambling and drinking. Oh, with the hurricane and the floods? Yeah, with the hurricane yeah. and the floods. So, I mean, that's kind of a, an idea of an act of God where people are very ignorant about things that happen. Uh, so, act of God meaning act of nature here, of course. God, God's not involved in the universe so we should not be involved in the universe, is what the devotees are saying. We've seen that the Lord is transcendent, so we should be transcendent. That's our conclusion. And that's based on coming to know the world to be um, unreal. Mitya, false. But it's false inside of the realization that Brahman is real. When, when people hear the teaching, God is real, the world is unreal, they go, oh my, the world is unreal. Well, they jump right past the first part of that statement. God is real. <laughs> Why are you concentrating on the world is unreal? You should be concentrating on the fact that God is real. You should have been saying, oh boy, finally, somebody showed me God was real. And when I know that, then the world will become real. If I don't know that, the world is unreal. The one before the zeros. Take it away, it's all zeros. Adds up to nothing. But the one there, everything is real. 
So the world is unreal is, is a realization you've had based on not this, not this, that anything changing is not Brahman. But as soon as you realize God is real, neti neti becomes iti iti, all this, all this, everything is Brahman. And that's how you can get from God is real and the world's unreal to all is Brahman. Philosophically speaking, those are the two bookends of Vedanta philosophy and as far as sayings in the Upanishads go, and they seem to be very dichotomous at first, very contrary to one another. The world's unreal and then all is Brahman, you see. But the qualifying point there is God is real. God is the only reality. So if you looked at it that way, the perpetrator and the victim are both God, playing out a part. Why are they playing out a part? Because they both have karma with each other. Countries have karma with each other. People have karma with each other. Here's the place to work it out. The soul's birthless and deathless. Whoever died in the bombing, their ego bubble popped, that's all. Their soul remained the same. I mean, if that's the teaching you've gone with, you can't go against it. If you're an Advaitist, that's what you've accepted. You can't go and lick up the spittle you spat out a minute ago on the sidewalk. If you renounce the world, you renounce it. That's it. You don't go back and all of a sudden say, oh, the bombing's real, the people are real, the death is real. None of that was real. And the Gita, Gita tells you that. Arjuna has to kill his relatives in the other army. And Krishna's telling him, go do it, because you can't kill them. But if you don't engage in the action, then you incur sin. You're, not, you're going against the working out of karma. Those people are waiting for you to kill them, because they're not bodies. They, know their, they don't know their souls yet, you see, but you'll, you'll, you'll show them that they're souls, that they're not bodies. They'll, it will get proved to them because their karma will be extirpated and they will emerge as, as they are, shining souls, pure consciousness. So is there a proactive response, meaning, um, like I mentioned, the Buddhist tradition of taking on the suffering of others? It, I mean, it's, that's just one example, but is there a proactive response other than detachment? Or I, if, is there a proactive response she's saying other than detachment of saying that is the proactive response I mean if you if you do get involved that's your decision as a hopefully as a illumined soul or as a impartial witness you know that you do get involved with detachment because if you consider the thing to be real then you'll get swept in if you know it to be unreal and then you enter into it, then you can work with detachment. Right, so respond from the detached. Yeah, the yes, right. Into right action. Yeah. yeah, and you know, you yourself never got into a position like that, never came near an axe murder, never got near a bombing, never lived in a war, because you yourself, early on, were very careful with your actions. And you were guided right through that by the Divine Mother of the Universe, and you never had to be exposed to it. The unreality of the world did not afflict you. And if you looked at it from a distance or read about it in the newspaper or heard about it on the telephone from a friend or something, and you feel drawn to get involved in it, then, and you're making that decision on your own, then you better be sure <laughs> that you're very settled in, in your Atman, in your Buddha nature, before you venture into that that world of pain, world of suffering. You have to be very strong to be able to do that. Yeah, I'm looking for the higher road to that approach. Like, you know, we could have run to New Orleans, and so some of my students did. They said, I'm going to go there and you're going to help the people there. So right. You can make that decision. It's not, it doesn't mean that there's, you know, New Orleans, the things that happen in New Orleans aren't, aren't going to happen again and keep happening in this world because that's the nature of the world. You can't remove suffering when suffering is in the nature of the world. How can you be a Buddhist and say, you know, I'm going to remove the suffering of people when Buddha said suffering is? First, you're going to have to acknowledge that. 
then you'll have to find a way out of suffering. If you look into the sequence of the Four Noble Truths, you'll find out it ends up in the Eightfold Path. And that's all about right livelihood and right action and you know, right relations. Um, so there is a way out of suffering, but action isn't the way. Inaction is the way. Or action in inaction. Detachment <laughs> is the way. It's very subtle. Uh, the field of karma is very, very inscrutable. Is a good English word for that. Very, very inscrutable. Nobody can see through it. It's impermeable. So even the seers approach it very gingerly, very carefully. It's like getting sucked into a dream with hundreds and thousands of people who are always warring against each other and who don't, who, do, who don't want peace. What got these people into those situations? You know, they wanted to get into them, some part of them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't be there, innocent or not. So the word innocent, you label it, you know, look into the inner dynamics of the working of the mind, of the individual and collective mind, you're going to see what a amalgam this is. Buddha called that paticca samudpata, the interconnectedness of all things. And he was not teaching it as a positive teaching. <laughs> the New Agers go around and say, oh, we're all one. <laughs> when, you, when you get illumination, you go, I think I'm going to separate from this oneness. My oneness is, you know, the soul with God. That's There's no distinction there. My oneness isn't, I'm going to be one with your karma. As Vivekananda put it so nicely, and we should probably end here, God save me from my friends. God save them all, but save me from them. That's how he put it. God save them all. He was there with his sleeves rolled up, working for the good of humanity. But his idea was, God save me from them. Because they don't want to be saved. They want to be, keep doing this same thing again and again. I'm showing them a way out, they won't listen. I mean, if you want to jump to the acid-like truth, that's it. These situations that are in Maya, if you don't get yourself out of Maya right away, you're going to be subject to them sometime. How can you stay away from them? You divorce the thing. Koivalya, get my liberation from nature, from form, from karma. That's what we're after. After that, you can do anything you want. Really, you can, you can get into, back into the Maya, and, you know, like he did, and, and work, your, work, work the plan. That was his word for it. He said, get in there and work the plan, but make sure you do it from a realized standpoint. And so you know, you'll be inspecting yourself every time for, for emotion, for weakness, for unclarity. Why am I doing this? See, definitely not going to be for revenge or, or for, you know, causing punishment to one party because they were wearing the mask of evil, you know, and then feeling sorry for the other person who's wearing the mask of the innocent, when in the next situation those two will, you know, be on opposite ends in the Mayak fray, right? The innocent will be the... I mean, isn't that what happened to America? We were the heroes in World War I, too, right? Now what are we? Are we the heroes still, politically, in the game of war? Case in point, I'm not just talking about one soil, soul, I'm talking about hundreds and thousands of souls in, in America who are with the war machine. Makes money for us. Not even about winning anymore, it's about money. Power, dominance over others. Those are occult powers that are part of Maya. And you, and the, the spiritual aspirant wants out of them, no doubt. That's first directive. Get me free. Then I'll decide what, what to do with that mass of Maya that's going on. 
And that's how the Bodhisattva would do it in Buddhism. And the Bodhisattva is, is also attaining ten grady, gradations of Bodhisattvahood as he does it. And the upper ten are leading towards transcendence. In the middle, he's still working with the world. Well, the Jivan Mukta is qualifying himself for the Videya Muktis, qualifying, qualifying him or herself for formlessness, witness consciousness. You know, like somebody looking at a bunch of bacteria through a microscope, you see. It's like the soul looking at the world and all its conflagrations, you see, from a detached standpoint. This is inviolable up here, the soul. Perfect, pure, not subject to karma or cause and effect or anything. And down there is the world, you see. So you make that isolation from that to get your freedom. And then, if you want to come back, it's up to you. But you do it from a detached witness standpoint. It's a very powerful question, very interesting subject, and um, deserves a lot more discussion, I'm sure. But here's where we've run out of time for the morning, so we will end here. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you for the live stream event at 2.30 this afternoon, Hawaii time. Namaste.